Hello, happy Friday. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan <coughs> Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Julie, Julie Landry DeBauer from the Alberta Conservation Association will be talking about developing predictive models of occurrence for grassland birds in Alberta. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. On May 14th, Dr. Craig Willis, professor at the University of Winnipeg's Department of Biology, will be talking about bats. You can register for this webinar on the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, and just click on Native Prairie Speaker Series. I would like to take a moment <clears throat> that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Canada North Environmental Services, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Power, Sask Energy, TransCanada Corporation, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor is Eco-Friendly Sask, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Alberta Conservation Association. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now a bit about today's presenter. Julie Landry DeBauer is a wildlife biologist with the Alberta Conservation Association, or ACA, and has worked for the company since 2001 from their Lethbridge office. She has worked on various projects including Multisar, the Pronghorn Project, and the Tabor Pheasant Festival. She grew up on a crop and livestock farm along the Red River in Manitoba, and her love for the outdoors was molded by the countless hours spent in and around an oxbow lake on their property. Her personal interests include spending time with her two kids, birding, hiking, gardening, and volunteering for her local church, community garden, and the Navy League of Canada. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Julie. Julie, you're welcome to go ahead there. Okay, wonderful. So I will share my screen. Let me know if it's fine. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the introduction. And um, I'm glad to be here and I want, I'm very excited to share a little bit about what we're working on. Um, so a group of us are working on developing predictive models of occurrence for several grassland bird species in southern Alberta. And today I will be showing you our preliminary results for about six species. So Caitlin, um, if at any point you can't hear me, let me know. I just, I've never done a webinar, so I'm hoping that I'm loud enough. Yes, you're perfect. Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, let's get started. So first off, I wasn't sure how far stretched the webinar was going, so I thought I would give a brief introduction to the organization I work for. So the Alberta Conservation Association, or ACA, is a not-for-profit charitable organization and a delegated administrative organization. That's a big mouthful, so we normally see, say DAO, and um, we follow up under the Wildlife Act. And this DAO status allows us to perform certain conservation activities on behalf and with the pro uh, provincial government. And then we also partner with multiple other non-government entities to undertake many other conservation efforts. And our funding um, comes through a bunch of different uh, strains, through levies on hunting and fishing licenses, and through grants and donations from individuals, corporations, and governments. And our mission is to conserve, protect, and enhance fish and wildlife populations and their habitats for Albertans to enjoy, value, and use. And ACA is governed by a board of directors that consists of nine member group representatives, and that's shown here on this slide, um, one provincial government representative and two appointed public at large people, and an ACA University of Alberta chair in fisheries and wildlife. So we've got lots of people keeping us in check. Um, we carry out several program areas in fisheries, wildlife, land management, and communication and awareness. And um, if you want to know more about us, here's our website link. And this is also a plug to have a look at our raptor cameras. Um, we have footage on Ferruginous hawks as well as peregrine falcons right now. So go have a look at that. 
Um, I've worked for the ACA now since 2001, and I've been working with a program on or a project called Multisar um, since it first started in 2002. And Multisar is a voluntary grassroots conservation and habitat stewardship project that aims at influencing land management decisions, creating habitat improvements and assisting with their implementation. And we do all this to help in the sustainability of rangelands, the conservation and recovery of species at risk at the landscape level, all while trying to do it in a manner that also benefits ranchers in Southern Alberta. Well, now who and what is Multisar? So now the word Multisar stands for multiple species at risk, and it also represents the multidisciplinary approach that involves looking at rangeland and fish and wildlife management and land use. It also is multi-partnered, involving the Alberta Conservation Association, the Prairie Conservation Forum, Alberta government, including Fish and Wildlife and the Lands Divisions, Cows and Fish, and then sometimes we have other conservation groups that may be involved in the land in question. It just depends where and what part of the <clears throat> grasslands natural region we're working in. And at the center of all that we do, and at the center of what we call a team, is the landowner or the leaseholder, as they are involved in all the decision-making. So I recommend that you visit our Multisar webpage for more information on the program. Um, sorry, I, I clicked too fast there. Um, I'd, I'd recommend that you go check out our website. So when you first pop it open, there's a video that starts talking about prairie conservation and about our program, and there's the link at the bottom there. Okay, on to a little bit of what we do. Multisar works within the grassland natural region of Alberta. And there it is highlighted. And just over 30% of the grassland natural region remains in relatively native state under either private or crown ownership. And the grassland natural region is also home to the highest concentration of species at risk in the province of Alberta. And what remains of these natural areas are always under continued pressure by multiple land uses, including agriculture, urban and suburban expansion, industrial development, uh, recreation, etc. And this is where Multisar can come in to assist ranchers and land managers with some tools. So our largest and most labor-intensive product is the what's called the Habitat Conservation Strategy or HCS. This is where we do baseline inventories for wildlife and we do inventories for range and riparian areas and assess the, the health of these areas. Um, we provide general and pasture specific management rec recommendations for a landowner. And we assist with habitat improvements. Um, we develop recommendations to mitigate industrial development. And then in the end, we monitor the habitat enhancements completed to see if they are doing what we hoped they would do. So for my talk today, some of the information collected during these HCSs or habitat conservation strategies is used in our bird modeling. So let's get into the why of this exercise. Um, here's a well, very well-known image adapted from Knopf depicting how different birds prefer different habitats and different intensities of grazing. Um, we know some birds prefer very short grass and bare ground, while others live in longer or long grass or shrubby areas even. Um, we want to take a look at point count data and habitat data collected in Southern Alberta and try to create predictive models of presence and absence absence for a variety of bird species and then link it back to habitat within the grassland natural region. So data used in this modeling exercise comes from 14 different properties in the grasslands natural region and seven of those properties are in the dry mix grass subregion and they equal about 150,000 acres. Five properties in the dry mix subregion equaling about 23,000 acres and two properties in the foothills fescue subregion equaling just over 6,000 acres. And on these 14 properties, as part of the Multisar program, we collect a whole bunch of wildlife and habitat data to, to that goes included into this HCS. So for standardization, for all our field work, we, field work, we start with um, a mapping exercise. We use what is called the Grassland Vegetation Inventory. So it's also called GVI for short. Um, and it's a digital layer and that delineates landscape habitat based on soil information, and landscape features on native areas and general land use information for non-native areas. And so this image here is showing a portion of a small property 
with several different GVI polygons, and they're all depicted by a different color. And the text that's on there are the different range site types, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. Um, on our properties within the GVI, those GVI polygons, we conduct 100 meter buffered point count surveys and range health assessments or transects um, following predetermined placement protocols, which I don't really have time to go into detail today, but I, if anybody has questions, I can uh, talk to them about that later on or after. Um, and this image just shows an example of, here's a 100 meter point count, um, several of them within one GVI polygon, and here's a range transect, and here's a range health assessment. Our 100 meter point counts are five minutes long and consist of recording all species seen, heard, and that includes birds, mammals, and amphibians. So we were recording everything for other purposes. Here's an example of what the point count coverage might look like on a small property. So these are all 100 meter point counts in various different fields, some tame pastures, some native pastures. And we collect standardized visual obstruction measurements. And so it's kind of our version of the Robel pole measurement at the center of each point count. So that's looking to see what, from a bird's eye view, what amount of cover they would have at a certain site. Um, from these 14 properties that we that I mentioned earlier, after scrutinizing all our data, um, our sample size that we have for this modeling exercise was 592 point counts. Our range agrologists collect a variety of range health indicators in the GVI polygons as well, including information on plant community, our litter amounts, amounts of bare ground, uh, weeds, etc. And then they take they use all this um, they use, they collect this information using standardized government protocols. And then all this information is then linked back to our point count data. So there's lots of information being fed back. In the office, we conduct a GI computer exercise linking each point count with information about distance to nearest fences, crops, water, and collector roads. So that's small country roads. So let's look at the species that will be sharing results about. The first species is a Sprague's pipit, which is considered a threatened species federally. And here's a photo with a close-up view of their beautiful white outer tail feathers, which is also visible during flight. Um, I initially had some sound bites put in there, but it looks like they aren't working, so we won't even bother with those today. <clears throat> the second species we'll be discussing today is the Macallan's longspur which is federally listed as a species of special concern. And here's a lovely piece of art that a great friend of mine and colleague made for me to further emphasize the wonderful markings of the McCallum's Longspur. Our third species that we'll talk about today is the Western Meadowlark, which is a secure species. And here's a picture of a singing male. The next species we'll discuss today is the horned lark, which is also considered a secure, a secure species. Here's a photo of a male horned lark, and then I have a photo of a female sitting on a fence post. The next species is the chestnut colored longspur, who is an at risk species based on the general status of Alberta's wildlife. And he, I was gonna play a sound bite here, but just here's another lovely photo of them. And our last species we'll look at is the Barrett Sparrow, which is a species of special concern federally as well. Okay, now on to the modeling. For our modeling exercise, there are, there are, these are the final covariates that I ended up using um, to test for probability of occurrence. So the covariates can be broken down into three types. So the first type is community, and within that one there's range health scores and percentage type of pasture, so whether it was native or tame, um, field range site, which describes the site, whether it's a overflow site, a thin break site, a loamy site, it just depends um, where you are. Um, the second group is structural covariates, and that would include robel pole measurements, so that's the visual obstruction measurements in centimeters. Then we have litter, which is in pounds per acre, and then we have bare soil, which is a percentage, and shrub cover, a forb cover and weed cover, those are all in percentages as well. And then our third category is a disturbance. 
category that has covariates such as pasture size, so that's how big is the pasture, um, and then we have distance to various things, so crop, fence lines, water bodies, and collector roads, and those are all in kilometers. So just to show you what we have to work with, here are some general information on the completed point counts for the six bird species that we're going to be talking about. So at 417 point counts of the 592, we didn't find any Sprague's pipits. Um, and then at 175 point counts, we found 210 uh, Sprague's pipits. And then for McCown's long spur, it was quite a bit of a different story. At 541 point counts, we didn't find any McCowans, and at 51, we did find 103. And then looking at Western Middle Lark and Horned Lark, um, at 395 point counts, we didn't find any Western Middle Lark, but at 197, we found a total of, total of 301 Western Middle Larks, and for Horned Larks, at 249 point counts, we didn't find any, and at 343 point counts, we found 775. And then our last grouping of chestnut colored long spur at 311 point counts, we didn't find any, but at 281 point counts, we found a thousand, right on the nose, a thousand chestnuts. And then for Baird Sparrow, 421 point counts um, revealed no. Baird Sparrow, but at 171 point counts, there was 234. Okay, now into the modeling. So pretend this is me. So originally we were running our stats in jump. Um, we were recently found out that a portion of the analysis we were in jump wasn't was going to take us too long. So therefore we decided to use a different program. So we we're looking at R. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience with R, but my coworker Paul Jones, who also works for the Alberta Conservation Association, said that he had lots of experience and he would run the, the stats for us. So in the beginning I was very optimistic about R and then a little further down the line diving into the analysis I started getting this this irritable eye twitch and eventually with more than an eye twitch after trying to wrap my head around all the coding around R. But all kidding aside everything worked out and Paul's great at doing stats and this is how we ran our analysis. We first tested to see if model covariates were correlated. So that was one thing. So if they were correlated, they were removed. Um, after that, we conducted a univariate analysis and only included covariates that were stati statistically significant <clears throat> and removed any, any of them that weren't. We then standardized all the continuous covariates. So anything that was on different playing levels, we try to make them all on the same playing level. And we used the dredge function for all significant covariance to create our models. And we were only interested in models with delta AICs of less than two. So the archaic information criterion um, is a way of selecting, or AIC is a way of selecting a model from a set of models that has the best fit to the truth of presence absence for a species. And then obviously, like anything, a model is only as good as the quality of the input of the information that you're putting into the models, right? And lastly, what we did is if a covariate was categorical, we did a multiple comparison to see which category was more important to the species. All right, and this is a graph of the results of our univariate analysis. And a couple of things of note is um, for McCown's long spur to the covariates, we had to do some adjusting. So the we cover, uh, we encountered convergence. So there was a lot of zeros. So zeros just kind of causes a lot of error. So we pulled that that um, covariate out of the analysis because too many zeros is just making it, it's just weighting it too much one way or the other. Um, and then for the range site, we adjusted the amounts of different types within it. We decreased the categories because we were getting close to convergence. So we didn't want to, we tried to avoid that. So we just reduced the categories there. And then it's of interest to look at um, field type, which is either native or tame, was important for all the species. And then distance to crop was also important for all the species. So um, yeah, those are all, these are all included in running in the models. So now for our results. Sprague's pipit had 10 models under delta AIC of two. And these are the covariates found in the top model. So bare soil percentage, 
distance to crop, uh, litter in pounds, shrub cover percentage, distance to collect to roads, and type of pasture. When looking at the covariates that had the highest relative importance, we found that Sprague's pivot prefers areas of increased litter, so increased litter, and away from crops, that's great, and more frequently found in native pastures as opposed to tame. Not that we didn't find them in tame, but they were found more frequently in native. They prefer areas of less bare soil, <clears throat> so they want have a little bit more cover there, and less shrubs. And interestingly, we did find that there was a positive relationship with collector roads. Um, this is something that we're going to need to explore further, um, as we need to understand the relationship between behind this, like why is this happening? Could it be a connection with a food source, or perhaps the vegetation along the roads is attractive? Um, we're not really sure yet, but that's something that we're hoping to look at down the road. For McCowan's long spur, there were six models under the Delta AIC of two, and these are the covariates found in the top model, so distance to fence, distance to water, field range type, forb cover percentage, litter amounts, shrub cover, and robel pole, so visual obstruction amounts. And when looking at the covariates that had the highest relative importance in the top model, we we're finding that McCowan's long spur prefer areas of lower visual obstruction, so lower Robel pole measurements, lower Forb measurements or percentages, um, lower shrub percentages, and lower amounts of litter. McCowan's long spur seem to prefer to be away from fences and water. And for the covariate of field range, we find that McCowns prefer blowout areas and areas with loamy soil. So it's something that we need to tease out a little bit more too. For Western Meadowlark, there were five models under Delta AIC of two. And these are the covariates found in the top model. So distance to crop, type of pasture, um, amount of weed cover, distance to fence, range health percentage, and litter amounts. When looking at these covariates that had the highest relative importance, we found that Western Meadowlark preferred areas of higher litter. They liked native pastures over tame pastures. And for some reason, they liked higher weedy areas, so areas with higher weed cover and weed percentage. We saw that Western Meadowlark preferred native grasses, but then we also had some correlation with them liking to be closer to croplands, which confirms, I guess, the thought of them being more of a generalistic type of a species. Um, we often see Western Meadowlark, this isn't a Meadowlark here, but we often see Western Meadowlark sitting on top of a fence post, singing away, and um, our data reaffirms this, and um, as they like to be closer to fences. One interesting find is that they have were found to prefer areas of lower range health. So that might be why they like weeds or weedy areas. For horn lark, there were three models under Delta AIC of two, and these are their covariates that were found in the top model. So distance to fence, distance to water, field range type, forb cover, litter amounts, robel pole measurements, shrub cover, and weed cover. When looking at the covariates that had the highest relative importance, we found that horned lark preferred areas of lower robel pole measurements, lower forb measurements, and lower weed cover, lower shrub cover, and lower litter. Horned larks also seem to be found more often further away from water and fences. For field range sites, we see a varying re result for site preferences for horn larks, um, with their probability of occurrence falling within many different types. So if you look at this graph, there's all the different types from overflow sites all the way to blowout sites, and we're finding occurrence on all these types of sites at different probability um, levels. So, But they are also considered a generalist. So we are seeing them everywhere. For 
the chestnut colored long spur, there were five models under Delta AIC of two. And these are the covariates found in that top model. So distance to crop, distance to fence, distance to water, field range type, um, litter, per, litter in pounds, range health percentage, real bell pull amount, shrub cover, and weed cover. <clears throat> Chestnuts seem to prefer to be further away from water, so further away from water, further away from croplands, and further away from fences. Chestnuts also prefer areas of lower robel pull measurements, less litter, weeds, and shrubs, which is interesting because we often see these little guys, like in this picture, perched on shrubs. But there could be a threshold where there's too many shrubs and it's not a desirable site anymore. So this is something that um, we're going to be looking into. Why? What's the perhaps what's the threshold for, th for shrubs and that uh, maybe there's a tipping point for them. Um, and then we also found that they prefer areas of higher range health. For range site, we found that chestnut color long spurs preferred loamy and some sandier soils. Okay, our last species, the Baird Sparrow, um, there were seven models under Delta AIC of two. And these are the covariates found in that top model. So there's bare soil percentage, distance to collector roads, distance to crop, distance to water, field range, type, forb cover percentage, and range health percent. And what we found is bare sparrows seem to prefer areas of less bare soil and less forbs and areas of higher range health. And they were also found to prefer areas away from water and crops, but just like the Sprague's pipit, they also seem to be found closer to collector roads. So that's something that we're gonna be looking into. Uh, for range site types, we found that bare sparrow preferred a few types, such as loamy, sandy, and some other types. So the, there was a little bit more variance there. So grass and bird numbers have been drastically declining across the continent. So what we hope to get out of some of this analysis is to find key areas to conserve and or to provide grassland birds habitat for breeding. And some of our next steps could possibly include um, we want to increase our sample size, especially in the Foothills Fescue natural subregion where we only have currently two sites. Um, we want to look at covariates that might have quadratic relationship as opposed to linear ones, right? So we, there's maybe a threshold for certain preference um, one way or the other. So is, is there too much shrubs or not enough shrubs? Um, we need to look at that and tease that out. And then we also want to include possibly looking at nesting habitat because right now we're just using point count data and predominantly we're seeing results for males. So male singing birds, um, we do catch the odd female in our point counts, but we go during the breeding season. So it's usually the males that are displaying. So possibly we'll look at some nesting habitat and see maybe it's, it's in a completely different part of the pasture than um, we're actually there breeding. Um, and then we also want to work with other species that we have data for because we've collected data for many, many years now. So we have a, a huge data set. Um, some of the other species that I'm working with that I wasn't sure if I'd have time to discuss, but I, but we are working in the background on, um, we have clay colored sparrow, vesper sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, and savanna sparrow. And then we also have this one um, grassland species of mammal, the, uh, the Richardson's ground squirrel. So we want to see maybe their link with everything. Um, I want to acknowledge the many current and past folks who have been a part of the Multisar program. Their dedication to prairie conservation makes it easy to come to work every day. Uh, here's a few photos of some of them. Um, here's my photo credit slide for all the wonderful photos I get to use for this presentation. And here's a diagram of the managing partners again, and then all the current funding partners and organizations that have an input in Multisar and uh, what we do and how we get it done. And one thing I always like to mention every time I do a talk or talk to anybody who's not part of the ranching community is, is to mention to everyone to thank a producer when they can. Um, this photo is like is from a friend of mine who is sharing their passion and their knowledge and their experience onto the next generation. That's her little guy there checking the cows. Um, without the ranching community, there would be no prairie. 
And with that, I guess I'm a little bit, I'm done quicker. I had a few extra things, but we couldn't play them, the audio portions. But uh, Caitlin, I, if there's anything else I could ask or answer questions. Okay, thanks, Julie. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. It's amazing the amount of work that Alberta Conservation Association is doing. And, and yeah, thank you for the great presentation today. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that when you leave this webinar, there will be a quick one-minute survey that will pop up. If you don't mind taking a minute to fill that out, that will help us to keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. Um, Julie, could you tell us a little bit about how it works to get funding for species that are considered to be secure? Oh, that is a good question. Hmm. Well, it's kind of like a holistic thing because we get funding for species at risk, but in the same habitat as species at risk, there are secure species. So it's kind of, if we're securing habitat for um, a listed species, we're also securing habitat for a non-listed species. So it's not that we're always going for a species that's listed. Um, there is funding that we had um, it depends where you're looking for grants, but we did get a grant through the federal government that was looking at different species that were not listed. So it just depends. You have to look around. Um, if you want, I can chat with whoever asked the question offline and we can discuss that. Okay, excellent. Um, your email address is up, so um, I guess I'll just ask the person to email you directly with more. Yeah, yeah. Great. I'm not really sure which species, but... Yeah, thanks for that answer, Julie. Um, our next question is from a listener named Leslie, and she would like to know, would the roads provide gravel more easily for the birds who like to be near roads? Gravel for their crop, is that what? Is yeah, that, I think so. Is that what they're getting at? Yeah, that is a good point too. That's something that, you know, would be a value to them. No doubt, no, I agree. Yeah. And the next question is, what are the implications of your research for, for producers? Oh, that's a good question. So with Multisar, we often, we take all this information um, and we use it to guide them to do habitat enhancements to preserve um, habitat for species at risk. And then it's usually something that will be a win-win for them. So we'll try to pull out cattle out of uh, riparian areas by moving maybe a watering unit up in the uplands and so that creates um, better habitat in the riparian such as nesting s spots for something like let's say sh uh, sharp-tailed grouse um, or other riparian birds um, so it's it's definitely a win-win um, I'm not too sure what else they want to know okay no I think that's like a great something idea. like something like that yeah Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Um, our next question is from a listener named Dave, and he says, your work looks at habitat and other conditions favorable for protection of these bird species. Given the other ecological services besides special status species, including protection of vanishing wetlands, storage of carbon, do we not have, enough, do we not have sufficient scientific evidence of the need to protect all remaining native grasslands and tame pastures? It's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Do we not have? Um, yeah, or, like, do we have enough they... evidence? Like, do you think that we should be protecting all the remaining native uh, grasslands and, and tame pastures? Okay. Because they're Address. important for, oh. for these birds and ecological goods and services. Um, or do you think we need more research? Okay, that's what they're asking. Um, I think there's definitely enough evidence to say that, you know, we know that grassland birds are the largest group or guild of that's declining across the North America. Um, so there is enough information. This is just added data. Like we were looking at maybe specifically for, for this research to see, um, focus in on areas within our landowners that we work with to try to conserve specific spots. Um, but I totally agree. We do have enough information. There's like, that's the biggest part of Multisar is conserving as opposed to um, mitigating and changing. Thanks for that answer. 
Um, Dave, if you have any other questions related to that topic, please just type it in there. Um, so, Julie, our next question is from a listener named Daniel. Um, he's wondering if you have a research paper you can reference that describes your modeling analysis methods in more detail. Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know what? This is our goal for this year. I didn't put that in our next steps, but we have none of this um, officially in a journal, and that's one of our goals to get a draft done by the end of the fall. So hopefully, and then I could post that or send that to you, Caitlin, if you want or whatever, once it gets, it's printed. Absolutely. And then, yeah, all the R would, all the coding would be in there. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I don't have a lot of experience with R and no. um, I, I've heard of people that, that have tried to work with it and they had the same reaction as you and I really liked your, your cat pictures there to describe it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's definitely something they, yeah. It's not something you just pick up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you're pretty lucky that you have um, oh. phones there to, to help with that. Yeah. yeah. He's gold. He is gold. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the Alberta Conservation Association and, um, yeah, just, just a little bit more about how it got started and, you know, we're, Prairie Conservation Action Plan is based in Saskatchewan. I don't know if we have a Saskatchewan Conservation Association, but it's it sounds pretty neat. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think there is a Saskatchewan one. So. Yeah, we started in 1997. Um, we've been around for a little while now. So we stemmed from it was like a, a fund called Buck for Wildlife. So we stemmed way back with the government. There was a, a conservation fund that they had all this money that they didn't know what to do with. So that got administered to us. Um, and then throughout the years, it just kind of evolved where we have this memorandum of understanding um, with these levy dollars from hunting and fishing licenses. And that money, we have to um, we have to do certain things in this memorandum of understanding. We have to provide certain um, product or certain tasks that we have to do for the government in order to get these levy dollars. And that's a mutual agreement. We get together with the government and make decisions on what we can do each year. And it's talked about every year just to see is this or is this possible can we do this this year um, and then we get grants from all different funding a lot of it's from the federal government um, HSP is a, a great funder um, for multi-star CCA and the Alberta beef producers are great um, are great supporters of us awesome that's great it sounds like you really bring together kind of agriculture and environment and um, yeah that's fantastic right on I think that's all the questions that we have today, Julie. Okay, uh, great. So with that, thank you so much for the awesome presentation. And um, thank you to all of our listeners uh, for tuning in. I know it's a Friday. I'm sure everyone's eager to start their weekend. <laughs> so, oh, no kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. I, here comes the snow. <laughs> I know. I live down in southwest Saskatchewan, and they're calling for snow this weekend. <laughs> yeah, coming. Well, we need the moisture. Yeah, that's right. And it's been a beautiful spring so far. I saw my first snake this week and lots of crocuses okay. around so I can't complain if there's a little bit of snow. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. Yeah well thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thanks Caitlin. Thank you. Bye. Bye.